So today we're going to talk about auditing your Revit project with ID8 Explorer. ID8 Explorer is one set of a uh, suite of solutions that ID8 software offers. And as Annalisa mentioned, um, our next up for Microsoft um, uh, uh, <clears throat> seminars is going to be on ID8 apps. So that's the uh, application all the way to the right. So with that, we're here to learn about ID8 Explorer and auditing your Revit project. What is it all about? Um, well, your Revit project can quickly get out of hand with thousands and thousands of elements. And if you're not maintaining your project in a sort of comprehensive way, um, things can be classified incorrectly, maybe on the wrong work set, maybe uh, items or line styles or text styles are sort of out of control. So ID8 Explorer helps you understand all those relationships and helps audit your uh, building information modeling project. So you can find and delete wrong or obsolete or hidden problem items such as uh, AutoCAD DWGs or MicroStation DGNs. Uh, you can get a full in-depth view of your Revit model and understand all of the elements presence. Um, so the difference between the project browser in that comes out of the box with Revit and ID8 Explorer is that ID8 Explorer is a model browser. It's actually showing you every single instance of every element in your Revit project. And this allows you to maintain standards compliance, maintain and ensure quality control uh, and across your entire project. So with that, I'd like to kind of just give you a little introduction of the interface here. Uh, ID8 Explorer is an add-on application uh, and like, as I said, it's uh, part of an offering of different products from ID8 software. Um, the first sort of the top part of the dialogue is all about finding things, setting the information of you, do you want to display the entire project or maybe your active view or a subset or a selection set. Uh, and then we can sort by, uh, you'll see examples of category, phase, level, um, maybe even by the work set. And then we can further refine that information with filters and individual search criteria. So I'm going to show examples of all of that. And then down below, the, the, the lower portion of the dialog is the results tree. So it's similar in the, at least the way the information is supplied to you, kind of like the project browser in Revit. It's giving you a tree structure that allows you to navigate to those particular elements. So I think the easiest thing is just to go ahead and take a look at how ID8 Explorer works. So I'm going to switch over here to Revit and I'll make sure that my screen is up to date. So uh, today for the presentation, I'm using Revit 2017. However, we have uh, supported ID8 Explorer versions um, back to Revit 2013. Most of our customers are actually using probably the last three versions, 2015, 2016, and 2017. Um, so a little bit, uh, there is a slight difference in where the tools are located. In, uh, in Revit 2017, we introduced the ID8 software tab. So you know we have our normal architecture structure systems, and now we have this ID8 software tab, which shows all of our solutions. Um, not only ID8 Explorer, but our other, our new ID8 apps, as well as our ID8 Sticky and ID8 BIM link if those are installed. If you are using Revit 2016 and previous versions, then the ID8 Explorer will be in the add-ins tab, actually ID8 Explorer and all of our other solutions that you should choose to install. So that's a little bit of difference there. So since I'm using 2017, I go to ID8 software, I can go over here and select on Explore. I can also right click and add it to the Quick Access Toolbar. I've actually already done that. You see here in my Quick Access Toolbar in Revit, I have all the ID8 software solutions. So I'm going to select and start Explore. So what this first does is it looks at the entire project. I'm sorting by category, which is very similar to the project browser. But quickly you can see that what I have here is a number behind the actual category, which in this case is I have 35,906 elements in this project. And as I look down here, you know, I've got one analytical beam, I've got 17 analytical nodes, you know, I've got 786 curtain panels. It's giving me a nice quick count of all the instances of items that I have. 
So for instance, if I scroll down here and maybe go to that curtain panel, I've got 786. If I open that up and start to expand underneath curtain panels, we organize that by operable, sliding, or system panels. So maybe I then expand on operable panels. And I see I've got clear glazing and I've also got frit pattern glazing. So if I expand on clear glazing, and I'm going to open this up just a little bit so you can see, it actually is the instance of, so there are 44 of this, these clear glazing panels. If I want to go to a particular panel, I can simply double click and uh, ID8 Explorer will automatically zoom to that element. So again, if I go to different panels here, I'm double clicking and I'm zooming to that uh, location. If I do this, the check mark, it means I've made that into the selection set. So here is the selection set. Right now, in kind of a purple color, I've highlighted that particular window. If I now go one level up and say, well, I don't want just that one instance. I want all 44 of those clear glazing operable panels. Now I select all 44. Now in the dialog, notice that the 44 is selected it also is the same 44 that's selected under the Revit um, panel as well. So it's showing me that I have that in the selection set. Now, ID8 Explorer is what we call non-modal, which basically just means that you can work with any uh, Revit command while the dialog is open. So for instance, I can now come over here to the properties palette, this operable panel, and I can say, you know what, I actually want this to be, instead of a, uh, an operable uh, clear glazing, I want it to be a sliding panel instead. So what uh, it does is it now takes all 44 of those and reclassifies them over to the sliding panel, and it adds four more, so now we have 48. So you can see now it's very easy to sort of reclassify elements. And again, I mentioned you can use any particular command in Revit. You know, I can zoom in, I can zoom out. Um, I'll, you'll see I'll be able to sort of reclassify elements um, based on work sets or textiles or line styles, all without having to close the, um, soft, the ID8 Explorer dialog. However, if I do want some screen real estate, I have this um, auto hide. And so what that does is it makes the ID8 Explorer dialog, it reduces it in size to this icon. So then again, I have more, I can zoom in and zoom out and see my full um, screen display or canvas, and then I can float back over and the window will pop up. And if I float over, it's about two second delay, and then it will reduce. For the presentation today, since I'm going to be in the ID8 Explorer dialog quite a bit, I'm going to turn the auto hide off um, because I think it's easier to see as I'm sort of working back and forth. Now, what I also like to show here to start out a little bit kind of the introduction to ID8 Explorer before I get into the sort of top 10 auditing tips is, well, okay, we've got this project, which is this conference center. And as I mentioned, there are 35,000 items. Well, what happens if I have a brand new file? So I'm going to show you what it looks like sort of out of the box. I'm going to start a new project. Of course, I haven't saved the project. Um, and I'm going to start an architectural project here, just the standard that comes with Autodesk, and, um, or with Revit, I should say. Um, and so notice that now our ID8 Explorer uh, tree is different. It's telling me the project name. In this case, I haven't even saved this project yet, so it just says Project 1. So in this, this project, which is really the template, right, that's supplied by Autodesk, in the sense of the template has 32 items. We have a couple levels, we have a survey point, we have nine views, we have some work plane grids, and so forth. So it's pretty uh, bare bones. Notice that there are no walls or doors or floors. So for instance, if I come over to the architectural tab and I select on walls architectural and I start to draw, all right, so I'm just drawing this, these simple uh, walls here. Notice that those are being added uh, in real time. So now I have six walls. And if I go over now and select under, let's say, doors, I'm going to add a couple doors. And then I might want to go over and add a couple windows. And I'll do that. And so now notice that those are uh, available to me. And I actually, if I come down to the windows, you can see that I have placed three instances of those windows. And in fact, I can select on any one of those or all three of them if I so desire. So for instance, now that I've got those uh, selected, let's go back over here, let's get out of that command, and let's select on all three of those windows. 
and it might be kind of hard for you to see, but they are selected. And again, I can then you know, decide to manipulate them or change them in some way. As an example, what I may want to do is, right now, I'm looking at this information, these you know, six walls, these three windows, these two doors that I have. And again, I'm looking by sorting by category. But maybe I want to sort by level. So in fact, we have you know, level one with the 12 items, all the two doors, the levels, the walls, the windows, and we have level two. Actually, the only thing assigned to level two at this point is the level uh, marker itself. So for instance, maybe I wanted to navigate to one of the views, and I can do that with the ID8 Explorer. I can come over here to my building elevations, and I can say, show me the south elevation. Right? And let's say that I now want to select on, uh, go back over here to Explore. I want to select on those three windows, right? So those are on level one. There's the windows, the three of them. And now, again, let's say that I want those to be up on level two, as an example. And I'll just apply those. So notice that those are immediately reclassified in ID8 Explorer under level two. So that's a quick way to sort of see how things are uh, automatic and dynamic. And that's really what I want to show you is that ID8 Explorer is completely dynamic with the information within the Revit model. And in fact, if I go back here to the, the view, let's say uh, we'll go here to uh, one of the four plans here, level one, double click on it. And again, maybe I'd like to fit that view. Right? And I can actually select elements within the model itself. So for instance, if I say that, okay, in the canvas, I'm going to select on uh, those three walls and those two doors. I can change this to current selection. And now I want to look at this by, um, let's say, by category. So now notice that I did just select those two doors and those three walls. And so I have those in my selection set. So the point here is that I can select items in the Revit canvas and have it reflect in the ID8 Explorer window, or I can select items in the ID8 Explorer window and have it reflect on the Revit canvas. So it, again, it's dynamic, it's working both ways. So let's go over here, and this is, even though uh, you know, this is an amazing architectural project, I'm sure, I'm gonna close out of this and not save it. And I'll go back to my conference center where I'm going to use this conference center, um, I think it's the Audubon um, set that uh, Autodesk actually delivers with some of their data sets. And we're going to switch back this to the entire project, and again by category for the time being. Okay? So that's a quick whirlwind tour of just the interface and how ID8 Explorer works with the dialog and work, works with the Revit Canvas. So I'm going to switch back here. So I think I'd like to go right now into auditing your Revit project and show you the top 10 tips for using ID8 Explorer. Now, there are literally, you know, hundreds of workflows that are supported with ID8 Explorer. But I'm going to show you what I think are the top 10 that you should keep an eye out for um, sort of reviewing your Revit model on a daily basis to make sure that your uh, Revit model is healthy and lightweight and well organized. So the first tip, number 10, is being able to scan for the element count. Now I already showed you that, um, where uh, there is an element count to the right of every single category. Um, this is sort of like taking your project's blood pressure. It's a very quick, easy way to review the information. So if one day you go into the project and you've got 500 uh, curtain grids, and then the next day there's 1,000, well, maybe there's something uh, wrong, or maybe that got copied incorrectly, or maybe your, your individual people were really working very hard. Uh, but it's kind of a, a nice way to sort of keep count or keep track of that information. And not only can we do that um, element count, but we can start to look at custom filtering. And so we can apply any Revit filter um, to any category. So I want to show you an example of that. So let's switch back over here to Revit. And so when it comes to that um, element count, as I mentioned, you know, we have 35,000 elements in our entire project. And by the way, speaking of filters, I'll just show you that we have sort of two filters to start out with. 
we have this annotation filter that's showing me just annotation elements and categories. So as I expand that a little bit, there are things like tags, dimensions, legends, uh, you know, lines. These are sort of you know, all in the annotation side of things in Revit. And then there are model elements. So I can uh, uh, switch to model. When I look at model elements, those are sort of physical things, right? Casework, ceilings, curtain panels, um, you know, uh, furniture systems, and so forth. So we can quickly sort of identify items between model or um, annotation category. But in this case, I'm going to look at all of them, right? And I'm going to say that I, I'm going to clear my selection. I'm looking at the entire project. So as I scroll down here, the element count tells me that I have 319 walls in this project. If I want to quickly just see how many walls I have that are shown in this view, which in this particular case is a 3D view, so I might want to actually go now to a floor plan. So I'm going to navigate, um, and uh, I'll explain this a little bit more later, but I can come over here to views that are on a sheet. I can go down to my um, floor plan. And I'm going to bring up my first floor equipment and furniture plan. So I can quickly navigate to that and, again, go back and say, oh, well, in the project there are 319 walls. But for this view that I just pulled up, which is the first floor equipment and furniture plan, show me just the amount of walls in the active view. So now, notice that the element count uh, goes right here. It says first floor equipment and furniture plan. You've got 2,210 items but you've only got now 215 walls. Now let's say I, f I further want to sort of identify information. I've got basic walls, curtain walls, and then just this walls one. So what I'd like to do is come over here and build a filter. Now this is the standard filter with, uh, with Revit. So this should be very familiar to you. If I create a new filter, I'm going to call it interior wall. And I want that filter to apply to the walls category. And I'd like it to be where the function of that filter is equal to interior. So again, this is just standard Revit um, practices of building any particular filter. I say, OK. Now that I've built that filter, I want to apply it. So I come over here and I apply interior walls. Now it's only showing me with the items that pass the filter. So I went from 200 and some um, walls in this view down to 104. And if I select on them or highlight, it's now going to highlight, and you can see it's highlighting all the interior walls very easily in that view. Right? So now let's say I want to uh, deselect those, and I want to further refine the search. I want to search for all interior walls that have the word reception in them. So I'll type in the word reception, and I'll hit the little binoculars. Now that goes down to 13. So now I can go directly to the three items that I was looking for, which was this five and a half inch reception desk. And again, I can double click and I can highlight. And again, I, I now have exactly that item that I was looking for and I may want to change it or move it around or whatever. Um, so this idea of I have the element count, but I can quickly apply a filter and use search results to get exactly what I'm looking for. So I'm going to clear that binocular. I just select on it again to clear it. And then I would say that I don't want to apply the filter. And now I'm looking at, let's say, the entire project again, all that information. And since I still have this selected, it still says that I have one selected. I'm going to clear that by saying, OK, now clear the selection set. So that is um, tip number 10, being able to use those, both the, the smart filters in Revit but being able to understand exactly how many elements you have both in the view as well as in your entire project. So tip number nine is being able to review model and detail lines. Um, these are very important uh, in the sense that you know, if lines are classified incorrectly, for instance, maybe you laid out a ceiling grid with model lines. Well, those model lines are 3D elements, and they're going to print and plot in a elevation view, a 3D view, as well as your floor plan view. So maybe a model line isn't the best uh, use of that. Maybe you should have used a detail line, which is specific to a, um, that view that you're in. So if I come over here to Revit again, I'll switch back to ID8 Explorer. And now I'm going to show you another tool that we have in our arsenal of tools. I showed you the, the filters that we had called annotation and one model. 
there's another built-in filter called ID8 Audit. And ID8 Audit looks at items that we feel you should be taking uh, a, a closer look at on a daily basis. So for instance, now in this project, we have 17,586 lines. I can expand on the lines and notice we, we classify them by detail lines and model lines. So model lines, I have some room separation lines, which is a pretty good use of, of uh, model lines. That's, that's uh, fine. But under detail lines, I, when I expand this category, I see all kinds of line styles that don't really make a whole lot of sense. Like line 47, what exactly is that? Well, I can double click and I can highlight that. And I'm like, OK, this probably is a, came from an AutoCAD file, it was exploded in Revit, and then I end up with this sort of weird line style. So what I can now do is say, you know what, I want to um, go and select on line style 51, 49, 48, 47, uh, maybe uh, line zero. Um, and so now I've selected 481 items. And now I'm going to then say those 481 lines that were all over the place, they should have been on the A detail fine line style. And now, in with a, literally just a second, I was able to reclassify all of those. Now the A-Detail Fine Line Style has 1,167, and the other ones are no longer in my project. Um, or I should say no longer in my list, they're not being used. Um, so it's a great way for me to sort of, again, reclassify items and understand how these are being used across my project. So I can sort of make sure that I'm adhering to my office standards in this particular case. So let's switch back to number nine. So our next tip is auditing both keynotes and revisions and understanding how they're being used within the project. So if I come over here, notice that again, under the ID8 audit category, we have both keynotes and keynote tags, right? And so I can actually go to a specific keynote uh, and uh, you know identify that for me and say, oh, that, there's that uh, keynote, whether it's in this case based on text. But I also might want to look in, let's say, deselect this and look at revisions and revision clouds. So if I look at revision clouds, let's say, we organize it by individual sequence. So in this case, I come over here and I say, oh, okay. Well, uh, what I can do is actually, again, double click on a particular sequence, right? And go to write that revision cloud. What a nice thing I can do is actually select on the top level and I can right click and say, show me a detail view. And actually it shows me, again, all of these individual items. You notice if I come over here to the work set, it's actually showing me that these, this particular sequence We've got some first floor callouts. We've got some jam details. We've got some enlarged plans and interior elevations. So, you know, I can quickly get a, a nice snapshot of this particular revision. But in the case of, let's say, this revision here, which is number four, if I double click on it, I see that it's sort of blank. And if I click on the one up above, right, and uh, let's say I want to, again, look at that item. We'll say none here and uh, we'll right click and I'll look at a detail view. And if I expand on that, they're all sundial plan, which seems like it might be just a placeholder sheet. So once I have uh, items that have been selected, for instance, in this case, you know, again, this sequence number four, I have the ability to go and delete all of them if I want. So this is the ID8 delete command and it's part of the ID8 Explorer. So when I select ID8 delete, it says, you're about ready to delete seven revision clouds. Is that really what you want? And so I'll say, yes, that is. And now all of those uh, go away. So now when I go down to my revision clouds, I only have the two sequences in my list. So it's a way for me to quickly uh, purge out items that may not be used within my project. And again, it's always going to give me a um, confirmation of whether I really want to delete those items or not. So that was tip number eight. Tip number seven is very similar to lines and uh, the detail lines and the model lines is being able to clean up your text and dimensions. So again, back over here in Revit, I'm going to stick in this idea or stay in this uh, ID8 uh, audit uh, uh, filter here and I'm going to go over to text. So uh, under my text notes, I have 2,894. I expand on that, and it's going to show me all the different text notes and the text that they're assigned to, the text style. 
So you see here I've got 3 16 aerial 2, aerial 3. Um, what most likely happened in this particular case, like if I go down to one of these, right, these 3 16 aerial 3, is that this was copied from one project to another and then uh, Revit automatically incremented it. So what I can do is I can select on 3 16 aerial 3, 3 16 aerial 2, and I can say, you know what, it really should have been all 3 16 aerial. So again, I can come over here and say 3 16 aerial. And now it's going to change all that text and it reclassifies it. So notice in my text notes now, I only have 1 16, 3 16, and I have these other ones. Now, there are no instances of the text uh, in my project anymore. However, those text styles are still in my project. So what I would want to do is come over here to my manage. I would like to purge unused. And because I removed any instances of those, so if I say check none, I'm just going to come over here and show you the text category. You'll see that now I have that 3 16 Arial 2 and 3 16 Arial 3 that now I do definitely want to purge out of my Revit project uh, to clean it up. So ID8 Explorer helps you sort of move things around to the right um, tech, the styles, if you will, or families and types, and then you can purge out those families and types or those uh, styles that are no longer being used in your project. So that was tip number seven. Oh, and you know what? I'm going to do, show you one more, a bonus tool. So for instance, with text and dimensions, right? Another nice feature with ID8 Explorer is the ability to drill down into not only, in this case, so I'm looking at things like, you know, um, you know the actual category, right? Uh, dimension category, uh, groups category. But I can drill down into any property that I want to look for within the project. So as an example, if I select on dimensions, right, I've got 1,321 dimensions. I am going to use the ID8 query tool, which is this little Q button. That allows me to drill down further. In the dimensions category, I have all of these items. I can search by the prefix, the suffix. So as an example, if I go to suffix here, it's going to look through all the dimensions and it shows me, all right, you've got um, 986 that are blank, but you've got two that have this minus 19, you've got one that has a max, you've got two that have the typical. So if I say select on those two that are typical, right, build the list for me, and again, double click to go to that instance. And so now I can see exactly every, you know, where in the project that that is. So without a tool like ID8 Explorer, that would have been almost impossible or very difficult to find, you know, here, like verify in field or something. Another really nice example that you can use, if I clear the dimensions here uh, and say that I want to now go back to the, uh, not the current selection, but the entire project, I'm going to select on dimensions again, I'm going to use my ID8 query, and I'm going to search for all dimensions in the project that have been overridden. So maybe there is an office standard where you should not apply uh, dimension overrides to your project. So in this case, yes, there is one a dimension that has been overridden, and that's a no-no in my office, let's say. So I can s simply search, uh, expand, double-click to find that. Sure enough, when I click on that, yes, the actual value is 3 foot 4. It has been overridden with this text that said 48-inch 48 48 max. That is wrong, let's say, and now I can correct it. So that took me all of two seconds. Uh, again, if you didn't have ID8 Explorer, how would you find uh, an overridden dimension in your project like that? It would be very difficult. Okay, so let's switch back over here to the presentation, and that's number uh, six, uh, seven. Number six is being able to audit your families with ID8 Explorer. So not only can you audit the Revit project, but you can go directly to the family uh, information. So what I mean by that is if I come over here, and let's go again to my entire project. And let's look at the, I'm going to fit this, this view here. Uh, and we're going to come over to that uh, first floor equipment and furniture plan. If it's not, I, I probably have a lot of different views there. So you know what? I am going to go navigate the first floor equipment and furniture plan. And then we're going to look at, let's say, this chair. So when I click on the chair and I say edit family, Notice again that now ID8 Explorer says it's the chair stacking.rfa. And I can now look at information 
for instance, what dimensions are in this, this file. If there are CAD imports or images, I can look at that information as well. Uh, in this case, you know, there are dimensions, there are lines, uh, there are uh, reference planes that I might want to look at. So here's like all the symbolic lines, which are the 2D representations. Um, if I decide that I want to look at not uh, only the uh, sort of filtered items, but let's say I want to look at uh, other items like the actual sweep. You know, here is the extrusion. I can click on that. Or maybe I want to click on the sweep itself. So we'll say that, oh, okay, uh, let's go ahead and select on that. We'll say the sweep itself. And because, again, uh, we're talking about that uh, ID8 Explorer is non-modal, I can come over here and, you know, isolate a particular item. So, for instance, if I say, well, let's isolate this, the elements that I selected and just look at, for instance, the sweep items. I can do that very easily and then say, okay, let's reset that. So it's a great way for me to sort of explore and understand um, the individual families themselves within the project. So if I close that, I'm not going to make any changes to this chair. I can go back to my main project. Another tool for families with an ID8 Explorer is you saw me use the ID8 query. What I can do is search for, let's say, casework. And let's come down here to uh, furniture systems as well, or furniture, let's say. So I'm now selecting both casework and furniture. And I'm going to go to the query. So you see here the two categories that have been selected. It's going to look at, give me the, uh, the items or the parameters that are common to both of those, since it's a multi-category selection. I'm going to say override. So when I select override here, or actually in place, I'm sorry, it's going to give me items that are uh, families that are in place. So it searches for all of those. I now have 499 that are not in place, but 28 that are. So when I select on those, it highlights those for me, and I can now double click to find that particular family. And you may say, well, why is this important? Well, in-place families can really negatively impact the performance of your Revit project, uh, so that you want to make sure that they are used in a judicious way. In this case, this is probably a bad example. You're using these bookshelves as in-place families. A loadable family probably would have been better and more lightweight in your project. All right, so that's number six. Number five, I've already shown you a little bit about, it, is like being able to audit views and viewports very easily with Explorer. So again, switching back here, not only can I navigate, um, or I should, to the elements, as you've seen me do multiple times, but I can navigate to views. You saw I was able to classify these items based on whether they were on a sheet or not on a sheet. Those that are on a sheet, I can look at the first floor and I can go over here to the enlarged toilet plan and double click. Not only if they are, um, I can click on the view, but since they are part of a sheet, I can right click and say open the sheet where that view is contained, which is quite nice. So the view or the sheet. Another really nice thing is schedules. If I go over here to schedules, and let me just highlight on the project browser, in, and notice by the way, I haven't really gone to the project browser at all really in, this, in these examples. This, in the project browser, the schedules are just listed alphabetically. There's no way to apply a browser organization to um, schedules, only views and sheets. Um, so in this case, I see my schedules as key schedules, material takeoffs, note blocks. I can actually go down to schedules, drill down into, for instance, room schedules, uh, maybe the room schedule itself, and again, double click to open up and edit that room schedule if I so desire. So it's a great way for me to quickly understand where these items are. Uh, so again, if I go back here to my entire project, let's say I don't want to, uh, we'll go back to that first floor equipment and furniture plan. And I just also wanted to show you that if you come over here, we also select view references. So if I select on view reference, I can look at camera views and I can say, you know, what's the uh, classroom exterior here, camera view? Let's select on that. And uh, what it will do, it's kind of hard to see, but there it shows me the camera view. Uh, and so I can select on multiple items here to see the different camera views. If I so decide that I, this particular section I don't need, then I can actually delete that and go ahead, get rid of that. So again, it's very easy for me to review all the views and how they're being used in the project as well. 
Tip number four is being able to check grids, levels, and reference planes within ID8 Explorer. So for the most part, you saw that I've been able to uh, basically use this uh, sort by you know, category, uh, which is similar to the project browser. But if I come here, I'm going to close a bunch of these views there, get back to my 3D view there. And what I want to do is select now by level. You saw me do this at the very beginning. I'm going to sort all this information by level. And as I do that, I come over here to the top of footing. I see that there are doors on the top of footing le level. That doesn't seem like that should be right. So I'm going to look at where that door is. In this 3D view, it's kind of hard for me to see where that door is, so I can select on it, use a Revit command to build a selection box around what I've selected. So now I can say, oh, okay, I understand that. Let's zoom up on that. Obviously, that's incorrect. That should have not been at the top of footing. That should be on the first floor. Let's make that change, apply it. The change is corrected. Now, when I want to remove that selection box, I can simply come over here to the view and turn off the, the section box. So again, it's a great way for me to understand uh, how all these levels and views are being used as well. Uh, and of course, we can do the same thing with reference planes and grids. Tip number three is understanding groups and how they're named and how they're being used within your project. So if I come back over here to Revit again, uh, if I go back to, let's say, uh, I want to look at my category, right? And we're going to come down here to groups. And we'll select on groups. And I see that I have organized by detail group and model group. And in this case, model groups are typically like hotel configurations or maybe, um, uh, let's say, a, a condo room. So they're actually sort of physical things. I don't have a lot in my this project that are model groups, but I have a lot of detail groups. And I look at this and I go, hmm, they're not named very well, right? Um, I have a whole bunch that are, you know, group number 14, whatever. What is that, right? So if I go to that in a particular instance and I can see that, okay, group 14 looks like it was this sort of wood stud configuration. Or maybe if I come over here to group 16, let's look at that, you know, and I highlight on that. Well, that's a wood stud. So in fact, maybe what I want to do here is I'm going to select on the, the group itself I'm going to go and edit the type and rename that, and we'll call it Wood Stud Detail. So at least it should be named correctly so I understand what these items are. And so once I rename that, then I would refresh the list here um, because then now I would come over and select under my, my groups, and we'll expand that under Detail Group, and because it's alphabetized, it should be... So there's my groups, Woodstud Detail right down there. So now all of those instances have been renamed. So at least I have a proper indication of what those items are. So that's tip number three. Tip number two is being able to review and understand your work sets. This is very important because work sets can, can impact performance, they can impact plotting, um, and, and many different uh, ways of uh, sort of classifying those elements. So again, let's switch back over here to Revit. Uh, let's look at this again. Um, I'm going to navigate to my views. We're going to do my um, views that are on a sheet, uh, floor plans, and first floor and equipment furniture plan again. Now, uh, everything I've done up to this point, I've shown you category, I've shown you level here it's about well, how we can sort. I'm going to sort by work set. So now, notice that we've got project standards, user-created work sets, view work sets. And so if I come over here to user-created work sets, I can look at, for instance, work set one or furniture. I can say, well, what's under the furniture work set? Well, there's casework, there's furniture. Why are there doors? There are two doors that are classified under this. That doesn't seem correct. So again, I can drill down and say, double-click on that instance, highlight it, and realize that, oh, in fact, those two doors were classified incorrectly. And so now I'm going to turn those, uh, oops, not the category here. I'm going to change the, the work set from furniture to, uh, we'll come down here to work set number one and apply. And again, now those items are reclassified under the work set one. They're with the other 57 doors now, properly uh, categorized under the correct work set. So 
just by sorting by work set, you can change that. And you see we also have by phase, you saw me in my example by level, I can also do space, zone, um, I can even do with work set, you know, who edited that, in, in this case, Richard Taylor actually edited all this information. So um, it's a great way for me to sort of reclassify how elements are shown in the project. All right, and a drum roll please. The number one tip for using ID8 Explorer to um, make sure that your Revit projects are clean and healthy is to delete or at least review your CAD imports. Um, as you saw, when I import a AutoCAD file and I explode it, I can end up with all kinds of line styles and text styles that I don't necessarily want. And I want to make sure that I understand where these CAD imports um, or links are used within my project because they can really negatively impact the performance of my Revit project. So over here in Revit, um, we have a, a category called CAD imports. In this case, I only have imports, but it would also show you CAD links as well. And in fact, over on the project browser, again, there's nothing to show you CAD links. You have um, Revit links here, right? But there are no CAD links. So ID8 Explorer is showing you CAD imports. We have 173 of them in this project. And you can actually scroll down and see all of them. And then you can actually see where they're located. So in this case, I've got two instances of this door detail. I can double click to open up that view where the door detail is located. I've got two instances, and that seems a little strange to me, so I'm going to double click on the second instance. Well, ID8 Explorer tells me that that um, element that you're trying to view was hidden. And you know this happens to be a CAD import, but this would work the same for any uh, element that you select that's hidden in a view. So you can tell Explorer to go ahead and display that element. So it turns on the, the Revit command, reveal hidden elements, and it zooms into that. So in this case, I look at this, it's a site plan, and you know, probably what happened is someone in, imported this by mistake, right click, hide in view, and then they forgot about it. So now what I can do is click on that and say, you know what, go ahead and delete that. Um, oops, no, there are no elements selected. Let's highlight that, I'm sorry. I'm trying to be too fast here. And now I can delete that CAD import. Um, so once I delete that, now that is, uh, I can go ahead and fit the view, and again, let's go back to the normal mode, and now I know that in this site plan there are no hidden uh, CAD imports that could be potentially impacting the performance of my Revit project. Um, so it's a great way for me to understand that. Now also, when I see these like with X, this like green drain DWG, that X means that it's a partial, um, uh, uh, partially exploded CAD import. So if I double click on this, most likely it usually means like it's a hatch pattern. So if I zoom up on it, you can actually see that that was the hatch pattern itself. Because uh, for those of you that, you know, that work with CAD imports a lot, you'll notice that when you explode, it's sort of there are layers um, or levels, if you will, of when you do a partial explode, it's only kind of doing the first wrapper, but then it's keeping things like, um, you know, hatch patterns and maybe some blocks um, that have been created in AutoCAD together. So this will show you exactly which ones are even partially exploded, which is really nice. Okay, so the summary, what we went through in the, the presentation today was being able to use ID8 Explorer to quickly scan for your element counts. It's showing you the number of elements because Explorer is a model browser as opposed to a um, the project browser. We're able to review model and detail lines very easily and reclassify those and understand how those are being used. We were able to quickly look at keynotes and revisions and revision tags and bubbles and understand where they're being used. We were able to clean up text and dimensions and be able to even find overridden dimensions or dimensions with a prefix or a suffix. Um, as well as, um, you know, uh, making sure that your text is being used correctly and that if that text style isn't being used, you can go ahead and purge that out of your project. We were able to review uh, Revit families with ID8 Explorer and then also able to like search for in-place families or really 
you know, when it comes to the, the family category, you can pretty much search on any particular parameter that you want to look at. But I like to show that in place because that's important to understand for your performance for your Revit project. We're able to look at views and viewports. Uh, we're able to quickly navigate to different uh, viewports um, or views within the project um, environment. We were able to uh, sort items not only by the category, but by levels. We can understand reference planes and grids. We can audit and understand how our groups are being used, whether they're detail groups or model groups. We can look at our work sets and see how items are classified and make sure that they're on the correct work set. So it, you can quickly go through and see um, which elements have been classified or assigned to which work sets. And then the number one tip is being able to delete imports um, that are not being used in your Revit project. So a little sort of technical things here. I already mentioned that we support multiple versions. Our, uh, most of our customers are on the latest, which is Revit 2015, Revit 2016, and 2017. Uh, and you see we do actually do multiple sort of releases. Um, our last major release was last October where we introduced Navigate and the Query tool that I showed you today. But of course we uh, introduced a version for 2017 when Autodesk released their major version back in April of this year. Um, if you are a current ID8 Explorer customer, uh, you want to make sure that you, you go to help and say check for updates and make sure that you have the latest uh, software. So it'll tell you what your version is installed and then you can go out to the website and make sure that it matches with our latest um, um, uh, information that we supply on the website. And also, if I come back over here to Revit, we have very extensive help. So if I come over here to help, notice that I have you know, ID8 Explorer Basics, you know, how would you work with ID8 Query, and many of these are actually linked uh, to our online help. So when you click on ID8 Query, it's going to go directly to our help topics on ID8 Query and how would you use it. And then we've got getting started guides, which are quite nice, about little sort of tutorials about, well, if you are searching for something, you know, you select on the elements, you'd, select, you'd go through and you'd want to make sure that you uh, highlight on these particular uh, commands to get the kind of information that you want uh, for Query. So, uh, even if you're not a current customer, you can go to our website and see all of our help files and support files for all, all of our different solutions. So let's go back to here. So uh, again, we offer both a, a single standalone, so ID8 Explorer for Revit 2015. That would be tied to a Revit version and a machine. Um, so, and it's a perpetual license. Uh, our network versions are a little bit more flexible because they use the same technology that Autodesk uses, FlexLM, and it allows you to, ha to have multiple versions. So if you're running in your office, let's say Revit 2015 and 2016, uh, the network version would give you access to ID8 Explorer on either of those Revit versions. Uh, so if you had a five pack of ID8 Explorer, um, you can run five concurrent licenses in any particular version configuration that you like. Um, we also support Revit deployment just like Autodesk does um, because we're using the same FlexLM technology. I already mentioned that we have a lot of online training and web support and real in-product help files and of course multiple version support. Uh, and then ID8 um, solutions are really focused on Revit data management needs. So we have a number of solutions, as you see there to the right, ID8 Explorer, BIMLink, Sticky, and ID8 Apps um, that are available and all the information is um, you can go to Microsoft Solutions and then link uh, that information to our website at ID8 Software.